Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Josh Mason. You may know him as Bright for War on Instagram. I first caught wind of Josh's work through Justin at Tier 1 Gear Reviews, who loaned me one of his uh, one of his handmade, I think it was a Quaken, I think that's what he calls it, but that's what I call it. I was so blown away by the beauty and the design, but especially the refinement of the whole piece that I knew I had to keep my eye on Bright for War. After following his work for half a year or so now, I think he's making some of the most compelling and subtly genre twisting modern fixed blades in the Japanese tradition. And I can't wait to find out the why and the how. But before we get into that with Josh, uh, I'd like to ask you to comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And, um, you know, uh, check out our content here. We do a lot of great stuff. If you're interested in knives and the people who make this hobby happen, uh, I think you will enjoy it. Also, we have a Patreon if you want to help support the show. Uh, Patreon three levels of support gets you a lot of great things, including interview extras, which you'll get uh, from this gentleman, Josh Mason, uh, this very same night. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, but the quickest way to get to Patreon is to go to the Patreon, uh, the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon, and that's where you can sign up. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Check it out. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife Bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? Shop at theknifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives, and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at theknifejunkie.com slash books. Josh Mason, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. How you doing, hey. sir? Hey, what's up, Bob? Doing all right? Oh, good, man. Uh, so before we get started, I want to get this out of the way. I think your work is really beautiful. Um, I love its uh, um, tip of the hat to traditional Japanese knife making while also you know doing knife shapes that are that are that are western in that uh, in that context i think it's all really beautiful and really refined but so uh, Thank you. we're we're you know, my my pleasure we're going to get into all all of how you got started in this but first i just got to ask you're an american man why japanese i'm curious um well I, I studied martial arts for a little bit um practiced aikido all throughout college and um I just always liked the Japanese culture, you know, uh, anime movies, manga, stuff like that. So uh, ninja movies back in the 80s. Yeah, that's funny. My uh, my daughters are now just getting into manga and anime and I can't keep up with it. I do know that when I go to the anime or the manga section at the bookstore, I'm like, mm, they have a lot of stuff mixed together. Yeah. <laughs> Some that's appropriate for kids. But anyway, it's I don't it, like it all. Yeah. But, <laughs> well. So I, I I did a little bit of Aikido. That was my first the uh, first martial art I trained in, and I got really into the um, well the visual style of Japanese um, swords and the hakamas and all that stuff, and uh, that has kept up with me right to to today. I'm really into the kind of wrapping you do on your blade handles. Tell me about what inspires these knives and where you're coming from as a knife maker. Well. Um... During a keto practice one night, um, I practiced with the black belts. I was actually a blue belt, but I stayed after my own class to look at what the other guys were doing. And I noticed that they were doing a lot of sword play and, um, you know, Thomas Shigiri, you know, mat cutting. And uh, I noticed that their swords were coming unraveled. And so I mentioned to my sensei, I'm like, hey, you know, I know how to rewrap those. And he was like, you've been sitting here the whole time for a whole week watching us do this. And you haven't said anything to us about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me maybe six or eight swords to take home to wrap. Wow. And um, I had learned that from an old book um, somewhere in the library or something. I remember, you know, taking shoestrings and wrapping rulers and stuff as a kid and um so i just kind of knew how to do it and um brought them back and 
they liked what I was doing and that's how I kind of got started wrapping handles. So was this, uh, did this precede your making knives also it, or was it? Okay. Yeah, it did. Um, I made, uh, leather sheets and holsters and stuff like that before I even began making knives and wrap sword handles, um, things like that. So I figured I'm like, if I'm okay at doing the swords, I can maybe do that with my own stuff. So. Okay. All right. Just so people know what we're talking about, hold up a, a signature piece for us. Let's okay. see something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this uh, is, uh, the only one that has the the traditional style wrap I do is something really little that I made for Rebecca, my girlfriend, yeah. and oh, <laughs> and has the ham on and just a sharp little guy. God, that is beautiful. You told me it'd be difficult to hold things up. <laughs> but, so, uh, so if you can't see what we're looking at, we're looking at a, a very small, about two inch bladed quake. And that is incredibly, it, it's got this electric blue ray skin uh, under, under wrap. And then this gorgeous cord wrapping on the top. Uh, you know, just think <laughs> of a, a samurai sword. Uh, this is gorgeous. And, and it's sort of emblematic of all the kind of work I see of yours on your Instagram feed and what I've experienced and, and held in hand, uh, this sort of modern traditional Japanese. Uh, so, uh, but before we, we leave this Aikido class, uh, with the, with the, what do you call it when, with, with the mat cutting? Oh, uh, I think it's Tamashigiri. T Tamashigiri. Or, uh, I'm from Eastern Kentucky, so I'm not, that, that's something I've always ran into with, with customers. They'll right. uh, <laughs> they'll ask me to make some some knife and it's a you know big Japanese word. I'm like I, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm Send from a Kentucky, link, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so what kind of swords are these are these guys actually using to cut these mats? And because we're talking about straw mats, tatami mats mm -hmm. that are soaked and rolled up and put on a on a peg. I mean that's it's to approximate cutting through a person. I mean that's what the whole you know, uh, the whole point of the tatami mat cutting is. So yeah. what were these guys using that they're, they're chopping and their handles are coming unraveled? Oh, I'm not, I was young, so I'm not really sure exactly what they were doing. Um, I would kind of stay after and watch. Um, mm -hmm. They were doing the, like the sword drawing and, and things like that. And I would just notice that their handles were, <laughs> you know, loose. And I'm like, well, I can fix that, but I'm kind of intimidated to yeah. ask the, you know, or mention it but when i did they gave me like you know like i said six or eight of them and um just kind of went from there man as a as a as a young kid walking home with 12 or six six to eight samurai swords i, I mean i would have <laughs> been i would have been floating on there okay so you you show you 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 sort of prove yourself with this or you know you already know you can wrap stuff but now now mm -hmm. you've done it on a number of swords uh, how does this lead to the actual making of knives? Well, um, I've always been interested in knives since I was a little kid. Um, my dad and all my uncles, they always had knives. My grandfather, um, I don't know. I, I guess it was just in my blood. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think back like when exactly that I first started getting into knives. But it just seems like I've always been interested and um, I'd go to the library with my dad and, um, you know, I remember some of the first books I got were uh, the Juranich book on sharpening. Um, I remember dad had like a knives with gun digest book of knives, mm -hmm. uh, like a 1986 version. And that's the first time I ever noticed that, you know, there were knife makers out there and people who kind of did their own stuff. I just thought that a knife was something you bought at a factory. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of grew up looking at those old books and, um, you know, dad always had knives at the house. My uncles always had knives. And um, that was just, I don't know. Yeah, but they're okay. So I like you, 
Uh, I can't trace it back, you know. I I can trace it. Through, <laughs> I can trace it through movies and then pocket knives my grandpa gave me and all that. And I can go as far back as a uh, toy knife my older brother had that I coveted that he wouldn't let me play with. So <laughs> it goes back really far. But there must have been a point for you when you first decided, wait a second, I'm a handy guy. I could start doing this myself. I know I can cord wrap. Uh, let me let me try and make a knife. Like, how, how did that happen? Um, well, I kind of always thought it was an impossibility because I figured if you're going to make knives, you have to have, um, like a shop full of equipment, you know, mm. thousands of dollars worth of stuff, a big shop. And one of the first books I picked up was by Wayne Goddard, um, the $50 knife book. Yeah. And <laughs> I found that at a Barnes and Noble or something. And I'm like, okay, 50 bucks. You know, so I started flipping through this book and it just kind of inspired me to get moving on this thing. I can I can do this. So um, I kind of saved up some money and got a coot grinder and just kind of cobbled it together on a frame. And I didn't have anywhere to do this stuff, but like my parents backyard. So mm. I cobbled it together, put a motor on it just temporarily. I wasn't even, I was planning on putting on something more permanent, but I flipped it on. It worked. I put a blade to the belt and it immediately burned my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that Welcome. how much friction it would cause. So, um, just, and actually, man, I moved out of the backyard mm, a couple years ago. I did that. I did it that way for my whole knife making career out in the backyard. Just like uh, Wayne Goddard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a couple of things to say about that. I have that Wayne Goddard book too. And, and I noodle around, I stop and start with, with hobby uh, knife making in my backyard. I have to, <laughs> I have to bring the extension cord out to the shed, pull the table. Out. So it sounds like you only way less consistent <laughs> way, and way less skilled. But but that's really encouraging to hear that mm. that work like yours and your, you know, uh, that you started out, you know, out there in the cold or just out there in the elements when when you could be, you know, it's not yeah. like you could just go out to the backyard when it's snowing and set up your grinder. Yeah. When it when it rained, I couldn't do anything. Um, I would have to wait. I have to wake up. And I was constantly either fighting daylight or weather. And as soon as the sun went down, I'm like, well, I have to pack it up. So, um, or if it started raining, I'm like, can't do anything today. Um, so, yeah, it was just pretty limited. But I think I put out a pretty good body of work out in the backyard. So at that point, when you were doing backyard work and and sort of uh, at the mercy of the elements, or were you now at a point where you were selling them and making money doing this? Um, yeah, I think the first knife I sold was probably 2009. And it was a, um, a V-ground, I call it a quiken. Other Quike. people say it. Quaking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Quaking. <laughs> I, I, okay. I, I've heard I'm... quaking. It just sounds like earthquake to me. So I don't really. <laughs> I'm a <laughs> quaking weird. when I see that knife. But, you know, I think you're. I... Quaking sounds m more correct. <laughs> Whether <laughs> it, it is not or not. Me, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, that style of. Well, okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, as, a, as a guy who makes. As a knife maker who makes a lot of makes most of your knives in that traditional Japanese style. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you, you do clip points. You do a lot of other stuff other than Tantos. Mm -hmm. How do you, but, but you you seem to have an affinity for the Quiken and, and, yeah. and those kind of knives. So how do you feel about the, I'm, I'm, this is my uh, loose wow. approximation of a Quiken. And, and and my and then uh, you know a an Americanized Tanto. So mm -hmm. uh, you know this is a, an old CRKT I have keeping in, in our bar in the basement, and uh, and the Americanized Tanto with that facet and the secondary point. How how do you if you had to match them up? If you had to talk about the pros and cons of those, 
what would you say? Um, as as far as a user or a maker, both. Okay. For as far as being a maker, um, I did the straight Quiken style because of a lack of equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have any band saws. I had an old cutoff wheel on a uh, angle grinder, and those basic cuts, like just your straight. I didn't have a machine that could grind in curves or finger grooves or anything like that. So as a maker, just that straight back curved point uh, style was just easy for me to do. Um, the Tonto, I had to learn how to grind that uh, correctly. Um, so, and getting that lined up is just difficult. <laughs> you mean all four of the um, surfaces that are meeting kind of at the front? Yeah, the facets. Um, I kind of have to hold the, the tip more of an, you know, uh, parallel to the belt. And you have to make the, the little, where it angles that tip, you have to make it um, pretty much line up right there. And it's, it's difficult. Okay. So you're talking, you're talking about sort of figuring it out, hacking through it in, mm -hmm. in the backyard shop. Yeah. Um, but, but when I look at your knives right now and uh, you've shown one and I want to look at more uh, and we've seen some pictures, but you can, you can tell that they are extremely refined pieces. How did you go from the guy, uh, Josh in the backyard, hacking it through to, to like, to, to making these kind of knives, like the kind I experienced that Justin loaned me and the kind I see in, in your pictures. Uh, do you, did you have a mentor? Did you, uh, how did this happen? Um, pretty much just, um, books, videos, you know, things like that. As far as my work, I'll look at a piece that I did in 2009 and be like, damn, <laughs> that's just as good as I can do today. Hmm. So that's because I'm limited with my tools. I had a, like I said, I had a very basic grinder. I worked in the backyard. Um, so things, I mean, if you don't ever change anything, it just kind of stays. I mean, of course my grinding got cleaner and I, I was able to, you know, grind things a lot faster, grind big batches of knives in, mm -hmm. you know, a quarter of the time than I used to. It just became more efficient. Um, but, you know, just having the limited equipment. Yeah, uh, that, that necessity being the mother of invention mm -hmm. thing, you know. And, and, and there's this constant, uh, well, push-pull with um, knives, uh, that I love and that I want to spend a lot of money on. And also my philosophy, I'm a creative guy myself and, mm -hmm. you know, my philosophy on things and, and that, that push pull is as follows. Like part of me thinks, well, if you do like the Chris Reeves Sabenza, if you do the same knife over and over and over and over again, it's going <laughs> to be perfect. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, if you do like, and I'm just pulling this out, uh, tops knives and you have, 500 models you can fully express yourself you know what i mean so there's <laughs> there are two real you know there's a real divide in in a way you have to decide how you're going to spend your time yeah it's like um bruce lee comes to mind you know beware the guy who's practiced one kick a thousand times <laughs> so, yes yes right yeah. exactly as <laughs> so opposed that, to a thousand kicks once or whatever <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's me just um and, and i really hate it that I wasn't able to branch out and do more stuff. I'm doing that now. Um, I have a shop now and a brand new grinder with attachments on it. And, um, you know, I'm able to, to do finger grooves and, you know, make my spines cleaner and uh, things like that. But, um, yeah, just, just having limited equipment made me a, almost a, I hate to say it, but a one trick pony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but I mean, you learn on that pony. So let's see. Uh, you let's uh, hold up something bigger. Hold up something that you consider. Um, well, just hold up something bigger. Let me see. <laughs> I'm gonna. <laughs> I want to tell you. I would uh, like. I'm. I'm gonna tell you something, and I might be telling on myself, but um, my 
heat treating oven is so small <laughs> that I can't do anything like over maybe 11 inches. Okay. And so, so oh, oh, that's a typical something for me. This God. is about six inches and uh, it's V ground about, I don't know, that's a little under three sixteenths. It's almost a zero edge. Mm, Just mm. real simple. Um, 1095. Um, that's a super basic cord wrapped handle. I, I did these for the holidays just to, you know, have something more basic. Um, I was doing the hormones and, and things like that and kind of got tired of that. I'm like, I just want to do something simple and, yeah. uh, clean and, you know, that's the Kydex. I do all that too. So, so this, this is the, um, that, the, I mean, this is part of, part of why. <laughs> I'm talking to you right now <laughs> is that I'm really, uh, I love small, I, I, I'm a daily carrier of small fixed blade knives. And, and I don't think that I can realistically go beyond a eight inch overall knife and be comfortable. I wear it in the yeah. waistband, carry it in the waistband about three o'clock and anything bigger than that starts to get in the way. And mm -hmm. I, I am a proponent of the daily carry of fixed blades in any, legal way you can do it <clears throat> or just any way <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but but whenever i see someone who is has got their got that dialed in i feel like that's very promising because i i feel like when you can make a small edc fixed blade or an edc fixed blade you can you can be a crossover knife maker mm -hmm. because what i have found is that there are some people who really like folders uh and 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 not just for the uh, fidget factor and the machining and all of that, but they like it because you can carry it around discreetly. Yeah. Um, most fixed blade knives and you know are 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 not built with that consideration. Like I can't walk around with it showing. Period. It's got to be in my pocket or you know stashed away. Yeah. So when someone when someone gets to the point where they're making great EDC fixed blades. I think you're in a good position because I think you can um, appeal to both both ends of the hobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, most people. If I make something bigger, I made like a, a big dagger one time, and it didn't didn't go anywhere. But as soon as I make those little six inch fixed blades, mm -hmm. they're they're all over them. So yeah, and and actually, I mean, even though you know, who among us doesn't want as many daggers as our collection can can fit but but most of us can't carry them legally and yeah. then and then there's the there's the the problem of actually having it on you a mm -hmm. six inch fixed blade you're you're likely to have on you yeah yeah so tell me a little bit about your process uh some of some of the knives look like they've been forged out by a team of uh, samurai sword makers. <laughs> uh, I think these are some of the ones you were referring to, to before, but tell me a little bit about your process. Um, basically, I'll just take, um, you know, bar stock that I get from uh, Aldo Bruno mm -hmm. or just wherever, you know, I'll source different places, but um, I basically cut things out from the raw bar stock with an angle grinder. I don't have a bandsaw or anything fancy. Um, pretty much grind the profiles. Um, I'll make a pattern first out of paper, put it on the steel, uh, scribe it, grind out the pattern. Um, and basically it's just stock removal, you know, basic stock removal from there on out. Man, because some of them really have a forged look. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, you know, uh, that... I I guess most of my knives are stock removal, and I think that that's probably where my my tastes really lie, like that clean look. But but sometimes that hammered surface is appealing, and and I know that you have a number. And right now I'm thinking of a a clip point blade in particular, where mm -hmm. you have sort of a an unfinished surface on the flat, and then yeah yeah. So so, so is that something that you pursue? Um, I try to do um. Those blades were made from a from a saw blade actually, and I cool. it was all an old saw blade I had laying around. I'm like, let's see if this thing can get hardened. And uh, so I tested a piece; it got hard. I'm like, I'm gonna make something from that. 
And uh, the pattern that you're seeing is actual pitting and, you know, age right. um, on the saw blade. And sometimes I'll put it in with a hammer. You know, I made a, a hammer. I put cuts in it to make like a texturing hammer. And I'll just smack that in there um, or just use the peen end of a ball peen hammer and texture the flats. And uh, when you heat treat it, it'll like the scale and stuff will kind of get down in the the low spots right right and then yeah. and then you can't yeah i love the way that looks that <laughs> the way it kind of and then if you're to uh, put it in and out of a sheath or whatever it starts to wear on the higher portions and the and the difference becomes so contrasty it's cool yeah i try to layer up my tape for the sheet so it doesn't rub or rub anything out in the inside the kydex so there, there's like a little gap uh, I'll put tape on the blade so when I mold the Kydex, it kind of gives it a little wiggle room. Yeah. So I, I occasionally make Kydex uh, either for knives that I've bought the sh whose sheaths I don't like or uh, occasionally if I make something I'll make. And Kydex, man, uh, it just messes up knives sometimes <laughs> or it can yeah, what what, what do you what do you do i mean like how are you because to me it's it it is the superior i love leather i mean leather is just sumptuous and lovely uh mm -hmm. but but realistically speaking for how i carry my fixed blades it's got to be kydex yeah uh, mostly with with one exception i can think of right now so i mean what do you do to minimize that kind of harassing of the blade i just wonder what's going on because like the kydex itself is not as hard as the steel so it has to be contamination yeah. <laughs> so what i do is i will take the two pieces and absolutely just wipe them with alcohol and make sure that there's no contamination uh at all and i try to make that process as clean as possible um i see a lot of guys and not knocking anybody's methods it, it's wrong for me so i'm gonna tell you what i do um, I don't rivet first and then cut and grind while the rivets are on the sheath. It's just, mm -hmm. you're going to get junk in there. So I do all of my Kydex work, you know, rivets are very last. I will rivet that sheath absolutely last and then fit the knife in, do any kind of adjustment. Um, but I don't, I just don't know how Kydex can, other than contamination, will tear the shit out of a knife. I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know what? Uh, I, I never actually thought about it too much, but you just, you just put it into words. The steel is obviously much harder than that soft mm -hmm. plastic. I yeah. know sometimes like uh, what I have like um, kind of messed around with the, with the mouth maybe and carved a little off and maybe a little tiny curl gets in there. And then <laughs> when you put it in and out, it's like, but still, how is that little curl doing that? That's so yeah, weird. Yeah, you hear the dreaded crunch, like, yeah. and you're like, oh, <laughs> the crunch. <laughs> There's the going to be a scratch now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I man, I, I love Kydex. And, and the way yours are set up, they look like you could drop them in the pocket without any sort of clip and yep. maybe a, a cord, or you could wear it as a neck knife. I do wear, I uh, do carry neck knives, uh, only, only at work, but it's and it's behind my little id so um but you could also belt carry it any of that uh kydex i mean do, what, what would we do without it what could would you be doing leather without it i used to um i made knife sheaths and gun holsters and things like that from leather it's just sewing it and it's so tedious and yeah. um kydex is super efficient super fast um, I was fighting daylight my whole career. Um, so I have, I mean, it's just something that's efficient. I try to make everything so efficient and uh, sewing leather and it's just not. And uh, you put a carbon steel blade in a leather sheath. Mm. You're going to find out pretty fast that uh, leather likes to rust blades. So that's something I wanted to avoid. It's just as... I mean, a scratch from Kydex, I think I'd rather have that than a rusted blade. Um, yeah. They both have their cons, you know, but. Well, I, I mean, as much as everyone just uh, inst not instinctively, in innately loves leather. I mean, there's 
like who doesn't love leather um yeah. still having uh your having a small fixed blade knife that's intended for edc in kydex is by far the most versatile you, you know you can do so much more with it mm -hmm. um and and one thing i think of these i mean your knives are beautiful and they definitely work uh, seem to work for edc but i i see them as weapons and because that's the lens <laughs> i see i see everything through um maybe like most guys or many guys um yeah how how do you see that? How do you see your work? Um, you know, ED, like uh, utility versus weapon, or do you do you think of any distinctions that way? Do you build for one thing in particular? Well, um, I can't. I think a knife maker, they're lying to themselves if they don't see one of their pieces dispatching a bad guy in a parking mm -hmm. lot or something. You know. Um, some of my stuff, sure, it, it's made it has um, self defense in mind, um, but I like to try to make things, you know, like this little one. I mean, that's it's just for utility. I mean, if you needed to do something with this to protect yourself, yeah. But um, I generally don't have that in mind yeah. with, with my stuff. I mean, um, not usually. I, I will build something you know what i like to say made for a man but <laughs> right right i got like it's a single well, single purpose you know yeah well your your knives like the one you just held up what do you call that knife the one you just had up is that um, you just call I, that a quiken mm, yeah okay I, I generally don't name anything people are I like, want you to name your knives. I'm like, I can't keep up with that. <laughs> <laughs> this one's Tom. This one's Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, Ricky looks like a. Uh, it looks kind of like a scalpel. Like like that knife looks like you could go either way with. It. I mean, it does mm -hmm. look like I said. It, it does look weapony, but also <laughs> to me, the cord wrapping is evocative of the samurai sword. And um, yeah, you know, that's automatic. You know, battle. Yeah. yeah, and and oh, I mean, to me, you know. To me, I have no problem with a knife being a weapon. That's actually what. So, so seeing it like that, and and with that, um, what do you call the the knot that goes around, uh, like as a finger guard? Oh, uh, the the Turk's head knot. Turk's head knot. <laughs> Hold I that didn't... up again, uh, so so we can see yeah. that real quick. So that ah, uh, that is such a nice flourish, and and it removes one of the main concerns a lot of people have about cord wrapping on a tactical knife. If it doesn't have a built-in quillion or some sort of uh, major finger stop, you know, that, that will stop you from sliding up if you had to push it into something. Yeah. Um, actually I was going to show you, this is the only example of my, you know, Japanese wrap that I have, but these oh, diamonds, yeah. you're, when you, grip that it's your finger kind of goes into those yes and this is hardened with epoxy so it doesn't need the knot and a lot of people will they used to see my old knives and they're like well your hand's gonna slide up on that have you gripped it i mean if yeah. you grip it you'll know right now that it's not going anywhere okay the large quike and i had uh, was cord wrapped and it was in that style you know it had the ray skin mm -hmm. and it had the cord but it had uh, the um the pommel was the was the tang yeah it, so it was really nicely finished and different from some of of yours where you take the lacing around the tang mm -hmm. or around the pommel so it had an exposed uh pommel but yeah it really uh uh was very obvious to me oh i had an example too damn uh but it really like th those alternating diamonds mm -hmm. because when you flip it uh, from side to side you'll see that the, the diamonds alternate therefore the peaks of the of the twist in the in the in the lacing also is alternating so it's yeah. really very grippy and yeah. then you add the <laughs> epoxy to it and and so that the knots aren't moving at all which i guess they didn't do on your on your friend's samurai swords or your sensei no. samurai swords but <laughs> <laughs> Once you put that epoxy on there, it's uh, it's amazing. I I recently got a um uh, uh a, a custom Bastinelli from from Bastian Cove. I 
uh, because he did a, a cord wrap on one of his models that I really like. And I was like, I, I have to have that. And um, so I'm just, I'm hugely into this right now. Um, I think it's great. I, I, I used to not like cord wrapping kind of as a, as a, as a, as a form of protest against there was a, there was a period of time early on when um I don't know, maybe in the late nineties where all these tactical knives were coming out with cord wrap, but the cord wrap was not like yours. It was just like, Oh, here's paracord. You can take it <laughs> off and use it. You know, if you need to make a parachute or whatever, yeah. you know, and, um, and it was leaving these uh, knives that were almost impossible to hold on to unless you really worked on getting mm -hmm. into cord wrapping. So for a long time, I was not into that. Um, do you, Sorry, I'm sorry for blabbing on about cord wrap. No. Do you, is it is it your intention? I know I've seen some of your knives with other kind of handle styles, really nice refined wood and that kind of thing. Uh, how how do you intend to take this style that you've cultivated carefully and expand upon it? Um, I would like to do more um, like guards, like do a guard or a suka, and mm. make like a, a G10 or a wood handle and do the wrap over top of that. Um, pretty much the reason I never did them, you know, the hand actual slabs, handle scales or anything like that is like I said, my backyard um, background. Um, I didn't have the equipment. I wasn't competent enough to shape a wood handle or uh, do finger grooves or anything like that. Like I wanted to, um, I, I wrapped handles inside at the kitchen table after the sun went down. I couldn't grind anymore. I'm like, well, the sun go, uh, went down. I, now I can sit at the table and do handles. Um, so I think that I would like to try to do more guard, like traditional guard, um, oriented, you know, tontos, things like that. Bigger stuff, hidden tang, um, maybe a sword hmm. i don't yes. know <laughs> yes we want that make a yeah. wakizashi for us please well so now that you have a shop how, how has that changed i mean uh you're you're you've talked a lot about kind of the limitations of how you started and how mm -hmm. it developed your style and and from where i sit you really really developed that style and and have pushed it to a to a refined level uh, now that you have a different environment that you're working in and a better grinder and such, how is that changing maybe your design approach? Well, old habits are hard to break. Um, I catch myself doing this all the time. I have a spaceship of a grinder now, and I'm still doing stuff like I did um, in the backyard in Kentucky. Um, I'm in Virginia now, hmm. and i um, it's hard to break. I mean, it, it, when something is just, you've been doing it for so many years and made this efficient process and you know how things, how the market, you know, works with some of these designs. Um, you know, I, I try all the time, like, Hey man, quit doing that straight ahead design, do something different. You have a badass grinder now. And, um, I'm still trying to break that. So um, I've made a few kind of knives with actual G10 scales and things like that and broken out a little bit. And, but uh, it's something I'm still, still working on as a maker. Huh. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. It's well, it's interesting because I, I just assume from looking at the pictures, you know, in your Instagram feed and comparing them that it was only a matter of choice, not a matter of, <laughs> you know, that you choose to, because your, your, uh, you know, your slab handled knives also look excellent and look, oh, you thank know. you. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, my point being, it kind of looks like you just chose and, but, but I, I see now that you're, that is something that you're developing and that you mm -hmm. want to, um, with my hmm. old grinder, I couldn't get surfaces like I wanted to, um, you know, I, I've been a follower of other makers for, for years and they've inspired me and I've tried to, you know, do things that they do. And I don't want to put anything out there that's, I feel is inferior. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do handle scales for a while because I knew like, this is junk. Like I'm not going to put something out there. That's not a hundred percent 
what I believe in or what looks bad or is bad, you know, I want to be competitive with, with other makers. And um, so I couldn't get the smooth spines and stuff on my handle stuff with my old grinder like I can now. So if I can't do it, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to put my stuff out there that I don't hundred percent believe in. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and you come from sort of a privileged spot of being a knife lover your whole life. So you kind of know yeah. what's bogus. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. <laughs> and, and what, what you, what you would feel comfortable paying money for, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're spending a lot of time on a handmade knife, you want to charge well for your time, mm -hmm. you know, so you want to make sure that it is, uh, tip top. I mean, you mentioned, okay. So you mentioned other makers that you admire that you've kind of followed who, yeah. who are they and what have you gotten from them? Well, um, one of the first makers I've really paid attention to, um, See, back in the day when I got the, the Gun Digest, you know, book and all that, um, a lot of guys were doing the um, the Sheffield, st you know, style stuff, the bo big Bowie knives, you know, mm -hmm. Mother of Pearl handles and things. And one of the first guys I paid attention to was Bob Dozier. Mm. And um, I saw his, like, just the raw grind lines and things. I'm like, well, that's different. And, um, you know, I just, you know, I'm like, well, that's, this is different. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, some of the guys really paid attention to over the years. Um, the, the guy that really got me into the, the Japanese style, uh, was Pohan. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked to him a lot early on, uh, Wayne Watanabe. Um, yep. I'm hope I'm pronouncing his name. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, yeah um you know of course hartsfield uh phil hartsfield um you kind of put me on spot <laughs> no 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 that's <laughs> you don't have to name them all this isn't the academy awards yeah. um but uh uh just make sure you thank the academy no but um it's it's interesting because i was wondering who I, I you know who came to mind i was like bob lum i wonder if bob lum uh but but because he kind of does some of that eth ethnographic does all yeah kind of done a lot of japanese -y and chinese kind of stuff um it's yeah it, it's interesting i love the i love um taking an an, an ethnographic uh take on a knife it, that, that that's not the right word but i love these kind <laughs> of knives i love knives from other cultures and um to see people like yourself um, modernizing them and keeping those kind of uh, the spirit of those designs alive. You're not making a Japanese design knife. You're making a Josh Mason design knife, but you're doing it uh, with that tip of the hat. And uh, well, I appreciate that. So uh, let me, let me ask you this. If you had um, to it, the, the white whale, what's your knife? What's the knife or the sword or the thing that you want to make before you hang up your hat as a knife maker in 65 years when you're done? Um, I want to try my hand at a, um, a Randall model 14, you Ooh, know, with the finger grooves, the and, attack. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I approve. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, I think I can, I might be able to pull that off. You know, I'm, uh, I've been planning on it for, for a while. So, okay. So a, a, a Randall, any, any Randall, but a, a Randall 14 is a mm -hmm. very American knife. Randall number 14, if you don't know, is a, is a, as a nicely shaped and a nicely sized, well, they make different size, a uh, Bowie blade for, I think it was originally intended for aviators. Mm -hmm. It's got the finger grooves and, uh, oh, such a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> knife. But very different from from what you're doing right now. Yeah, uh, very Western as opposed mm -hmm. to the sort of Eastern take. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, um, my dad was uh, he he was was always into the traditional you know Bowie knives and you know stacked leather handles and yeah. and things like that. So I came from that, and I really appreciate those knives too. And I'm a huge fan. Um, it's just I couldn't make them. And, um, the Japanese stuff was something that I already had and knew and, right. uh, it suited my, uh, way of working. It suited my backyard thing, you know, um, I, I could do that well. So if I can do it, why not go ahead and keep going, 
you know, um, the, the actual handle scales and blocks of wood and things like that. Like I said, I didn't have the equipment for it, so I never explored it. Um, I'm doing it more now. So I think that something like the Randall 14 might happen, mm, you know, uh, very interesting tang construction on that Randall and on yeah. a number of them with that sort of thing, like kind of on the top mm -hmm. with the slot and everything. What a cool up and no mechanical connection. Oh, from the handle well. in the 14. And, and that's weird to me. But I never heard anyone complain about it. I'm putting <laughs> you know? a pin through it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you break tradition, man. Yeah. I like that. Oh, yeah. So what is your, do you have a collection of knives? What would you spend money on uh, to get right now if you could get a knife? Um, I'm the kind of guy that likes cheap stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lesson one time. I had a, uh, a Benchmade Auto Striker. I Ooh. was on a roof one time when I was a kid. And had this brand new bench made in my pocket. And the guy that was working with me said, hey, man, do you have a knife? I'm like, yeah. And I pulled the auto striker out and handed it over to him. He hands it back to me with like 24 grit scratches on it, tar. He had cut the edge off of a, like shingles off of the oh. edge of a house with it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and I'm like he doesn't know what this is. He has yeah. no clue. He just yeah. thinks it's a knife. He thinks it works well. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So I carry cheap shit. I carry like a little, I don't know. So stuff that's under 50 bucks. I, Cause I lose stuff. Um, I'm not going to carry any kind of, you know, three, $400. I had a zero tolerance one time and I, I sold it immediately. Yeah, like I can't, Emerson's, uh, I can't be trusted with all. this thing. <laughs> well, so do you? Uh, I think I know the answer to this. I think you already answered it, but do you carry your own knives? Do you carry one of your own? I've tried to. I'm like, I'm going to keep this one for me. Like, this one's mine. And <laughs> no, I, I end up selling them. The and, answer uh, I've gotten when I've asked that question is, do you walk around with your paycheck in your pocket? <laughs> like, uh, no, but I would if I made knives. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, I, I'll I'll give them away or sell them. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I've never keep my own stuff. I've kept them for a little bit and like tested them and I'm like, OK, that works. You know, time to sell it. How do you test them? How do you know that what you're doing is like. Um. um I used to hmm, so I have a digital oven, so I know my heat treats on point, you know, all that's fine, but um, I'll just kind of chop into something hard, like, you know, see if the edge will flex and come back, you know, the brass rod test and, oh, nice. um, you know, things like that. Just nothing too brutal. I've got it down to where I'm pretty confident in my heat treat and geometry. Um, I've seen some guys just beat the shit out of <laughs> their knife or sword. And I'm like, now you have to refinish the whole thing before you sell it. You know? Well, so. I think, I think what you're describing is the benefit of, you know, we were talking about the two ways you could do it. You could, you could be like Chris Reeve and perfect the Sabenza, or you could be like tops knives and have 500 models. Mm -hmm. Well, once, once you're doing the, the, the same uh, style of thing or the same model over and over you don't have to retest it over and over you know once you have your system down and once you know that that it's uh reliably producing a reliable product you don't have to keep testing it yeah but but with every new model there's a whole r d process so you know i could see the benefit i use plain carbon steel that's the easiest thing to heat treat in the world you know 1095 is a little different because you have to have a faster quenchant and things like that um you know 1084 dirt simple i mean and that's i've used it consistently you know right. um so the heat treat i've done it for started at about 2008 09 that's what i heat treat high carbon steel so let me ask you this who's been buying your knives who's your customer what what kind of stuff are they looking for um, I have a couple of guys that have bought, you know, they have a little collection of my stuff going, uh, nice. but it's just, 
you know, various people, you know, um, yeah. just various people on Instagram, they'll see it and be like, oh, wow, you know, what do you want for that? And they'll get in my DMs or whatever. And, but um, yeah, I got a couple of collectors that have, I think I have a gentleman that has 20 plus of, of my oh, knives. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. And that he's collected them since I started. Like he noticed back then, like, hey, I like this. So, yeah, man. I mean, it, sometimes I, it makes me wonder. Oh, there, there are some of those blades there with the hammered finish. Yeah, uh, right there at the top. Those are so cool. Uh, it just makes me think, uh, as a a knife maker, um, you know, who's n not me. I, it always makes me think that if I were a knife maker and I were making all these knives and putting them out into the world, eventually you got to start wondering what is going on with these knives? You know, I, I put my blood, sweat and tears in these things. I'm releasing them into the world. Uh, are they sitting in a cabinet? Are they doing good? Are they, is someone, <laughs> is someone taking them hunting or, 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 or EDC or has this <laughs> been in a scrap? You know what I mean? Like, I, I think it's uh I think it, it'd be a fascinating question as a knife maker. I, um, I recently got some news that one of my, um, my models um, successfully thwarted a um, carjacking. What? <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty gnarly story. I don't think the guy really could disclose a whole lot of it. I'd probably have to talk to him in person about that. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God, man. That must have made you feel really good. I, well, not. I, I don't know about good. I was just, like, shocked. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, really good. Of course, it's bittersweet. You know, no yeah. one no one likes to think of rising crime or the fact that actually lots of people are getting carjacked these days. And it probably helps to have a Josh Mason knife. Uh, let me ask you, do you have a company name? I know you go for you go as Bright for War mm -hmm. uh, on Instagram. Is that your company name? Is that what you call your? Yeah. Name? Yeah. That's what I like to work with. Um, okay. I was doing uh, J Mason handmade for quite a few years and. Um, I kind of, it was so crazy. I ran across a, an old poem. I don't know what I was reading. I was reading some kind of book. I, I don't know what. And a passage in the book really just kind of grabbed my attention. Hmm. And um, it was an epic poem, like something that was half the book long. It was pages and pages and pages. But a little excerpt out of it really caught my attention. And I'm like, that's my new Instagram handle. And that's my company name and uh i gotta i have it written down if you want to want me to read it <laughs> yeah yeah okay. sure man let's hear it this is from um an epic poem um i think william cowper i think's his name um here it goes the far the first artificer of death the shrewd contriver who first sweated at the forge and forced the blunt and yet unbloodied steel to a keen edge and made it bright for war Man. that is cool yeah that is really cool that's a nice bit of context so i saw that bright for war that's, that's me. cool <laughs> hey man put that uh, i'm not gonna tell you what to do but put maybe you could you would consider putting that in your description of on your instagram because i know mm -hmm. you don't have a website at the at the moment do you uh, no no yeah put it up there that's a really cool little uh bit of context you know uh, because you immediately see that guy sweating at the forge and, you know, taking this um, element and, and harnessing it, turning it into something. I think you might have been referring to uh, Vulcan or, um, you know, some god of the forge, whichever. I think I think he goes by different names. And Yeah, he's he's uh, Vulcan and the, the Romans took mm -hmm. Hephaestus. And I, I'm Italian. I can say this. The Romans took all the Greek stuff, changed the names, and <laughs> said, oh, he's Vulcan now. <laughs> yeah, T Tubal Cain, I think, is another one. Ooh, that's cool. Uh, I, I, well, I say it's cool. It sounds cool. Uh, uh, so before we wrap up here, what about collaborations? You seem, your designs seem like they are ready or aching for some sort of collaboration <laughs> uh, either with another maker or with a company to produce your designs is this something you think about i do uh the company thing i i dream about that um that would be amazing but um 
as far as collabs, I've worked with other guys. They've sent me blades and I've wrapped them up and, you know, made sheets and stuff like that. And um, that's always really fun. Um, so and I, I've worked with a few other makers, you know, throughout the years. They'll just send me a knife blade or, or something that they've just bought, um, you know, different manufacturers, stuff from Japan. They'll just send it over to me and I'll, I'll wrap it up. That's just another fun kind of uh thing i do uh the elvia self-defense yes uh, yes i saw you did a, a copus designs elvia yeah 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 I, I wrap mine with jute cord but i might be sending it off to you because <laughs> <laughs> i'm like yeah this jute doesn't look so cool anymore <laughs> well i'll put stingray on it and everything man i'll pimp it out <laughs> that's cool man uh i'm writing this down uh because <laughs> i have the mind of a sieve um so uh where do you see Bright for War knives or Bright for War in, you know, at, when you're at the pinnacle of what Bright for War is, what what do you want the company to be? Um, I just kind of want to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I'd, I'd like to branch out and make maybe like swords. I like to try my hand at a sword. Um, like you said, the, the Model 14 type mm -hmm. stuff, a Bowie knife, something that I've always wanted to do but never could because of my limitations with equipment. And like I said, I've only had the grinder for maybe a year and I'm still trying to break old habits. And I love the Japanese knives that I do. I love doing them. They hurt my hands, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they make my, make my hands cramp up, but I'm like, I have to kind of get out of this mindset a little, I, I, like I said, I love them, but I would like to do other things. I just have to um, try um so i think adding some standard abs style buoy you know mm -hmm. knives um combat knives maybe even, even some swords you know um doing stuff that i've always loved but never could afford and that my equipment wouldn't let me produce right ah well that's cool and and it's it's good to know. I mean, even though even though what you've been doing now, uh, it looks very recognizably yours. Mm -hmm. um, it's also cool when people who have done similar stuff branch out and start doing different things. I love to see that because <laughs> that's where you know that's where the challenge starts. You get to a certain point, you've refined your thing to a certain point. You can take those skills you've learned. And make a Viking sax or something totally outside the yeah. box, you know, and and it'll be totally cool. And I apologize for using the term outside the box right there. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, so Josh, uh, please let everyone know how they can get in touch with you and how they can find your work and how they can buy your work. I'm pretty simple, man. Um, Instagram, you know, bright for war at Instagram. Um you know, just shoot me a, a direct message or something like that. If you see me post something, uh, it usually means I have multiples of that. I just kind of take a good example of the, the, you know, the batch. and But I'll have multiple examples of that. So if you see something you like, it's likely that I have more of them. Just send me a DM and, you know, we can discuss things there. I don't really like discussing things out in the open. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of this political climate, these days it's not very gun and knife friendly so <laughs> i don't, don't want to get in trouble with you know yeah. and because that's all i have is instagram if i lose that then i'm out in the wind man i don't know what to do after that so well, i also i also might add i saw <laughs> I, I i did see some of your knives on arizona custom knives i don't know if, oh if if they're an actual dealer of yours or if they just ended up there but yeah I, i've sold um some of my stuff to arizona um a friend of mine, I, I didn't know that he worked for Arizona. Uh, his name's Ryan. And um, he reached out to me and told me, hey, you should work with us and get some of your stuff out there. And I'm like, OK, you know, so I did some work with him and some of my stuff's on uh, Arizona Custom Knives. And yeah, um, I think they have at least 10 or 12 of them i'm, I'm not yeah and a number sure, of them but... have, a number of them had sold but there were some that were available and they're in yeah. that they're in that ray skin traditional japanese wrap which to me is 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 your most um 
I don't know, your most beautiful yeah. stuff. I, I really, <laughs> it, that, it, that is taking it to the nth level and I, I love it. I appreciate um, it. <laughs> well, so, so, uh, so check out Josh on Instagram at bright for war and also go to Arizona custom knives and check them out. Uh, they're, they're very beautiful and there's a selection. Oh, you're welcome. There's a selection. Of, I think six left up there. Okay. From, from the 10 or 12 you gave them. Um, in any case, there you have it. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, Josh. It was a pleasure to meet you. A pleasure, Bob. Thanks, man. Hey, it's my pleasure. And uh, uh, for uh, those of you who are patron members, uh, stick around. We're going to talk for another five minutes or so on the other side, and you'll get to hear that too. Uh, so uh, take care, Josh. I'll talk to you in a minute. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. It's unbelievable to think that he did some of the knives uh, that I've looked at and held, uh, or one of them that I held out in his backyard, uh, because that's the that's the totally bogus setup I use to make my totally <laughs> hack knives. So it, it is good to know uh, that someone is actually doing incredible refined work uh, in those in in those confines. And now he's got his shop in Virginia. So uh, the world is his oyster. It was a pleasure meeting him. Check him out right for war on Instagram. Also check out uh, our next Sunday interview show and then our Wednesday midweek supplemental and then always Thursday night knives 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, right here on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch live join the conversation. It's always a blast. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.